Carthage must be destroyed. We're going to end the Hail Caesar series today. The walkthrough will be ending with victory and defeat. I'm just going to jump right into it to get through it because I would like to also have some closing remarks on the series and um, some other stuff that I want to talk about that will go on in this channel. But let's talk about victory and defeat right away here. So Hail Caesar is a game that wasn't originally designed with points in mind. It was designed to put together your collection, your historics, your whatever you've painted and just have scenario based gameplay or at least that's what I've come to the conclusion of based on the rules and talking to different people online. Um, so usually in Hail Caesar you're gonna have some sort of scenario that you either have to you know like an attacking or defending scenario or maybe there's an escort scenario you know maybe maybe like I've set up some guys here I've got a, a Celtic chieftain with his son and the animals you know donkey sheep pigs and the vicious uh, snow leopard that the Celtic uh, tribes are known to cut, carry around with them as they travel. And whatever the scenario is, that's usually how I like to play. Um, but oftentimes, more than not, you're going to have just a straight up brawl where it's one army versus another. And you can use points for these games, or you don't have to. There, there's, you can play both ways, and both games are equally enjoyable. But regardless of how you play, Defeat is always going to come to one side. So how does an army lose in Hail Caesar? Defeat means when you lose more than half of your army's divisions. And we've talked about divisions before. I've got a general here. He's a Roman commanding one division there. And then I've put uh, a, um, a Samnite guy here. And he's just got a bunch of units surrounding him. They don't look like they're in cohesion or the same type of troop. But just to represent that. I've put them like this, and that's a second division. If you have a two division army, then if you lose one division, it's not more than half. So you could keep fighting with a single division, okay? If you have a three divisions in an army, and I don't have enough guys here to adequately, or adequately represent that, if you lost two out of three of those divisions, you're, you, you're considered defeated. You've lost over half of your forces, and that's it, you've lost the game. The rest of your troops run off, escape. Now that's what the rule book gives us kind of like the default defeat uh, conditions. If there's a specific scenario that you guys decide that, hey, I don't want to just quit the game when two thirds of my army is done. Maybe, you know, maybe there's a fight to the death scenario you've created or you, you have to successfully escort this Celtic zoo <laughs> that's going through uh, some area or land. I don't know. You can obviously change that rule. This is just what the rule book is suggesting and, and, and asking you uh, you know, if you can't think of something else, that's uh, basically their rules on it. So how do you lose a division in your army? If you lose over half of your divisions, you're defeated. But in order for you to have lost a division, it has to become broken. All oh, right. A broken division exactly is that. It is when the divisions are broken and they've lost cohesion and they're running. So what happens when a division, uh, what, so what happens when a division is broken? Well, just like an army having to have more than half of its divisions broken, a broken division is considered broken when more than half of the units in the division have been broken. So if I have four units here of different Roman types in one division, and I lose three of them, that, that unit's uh, broken, right? So over half. So if there's only two units here that are lost, I'm not broken yet. I gotta lose one more unit to be broken, all right? And you just have it or go over half. If it's an odd number, obviously you still have to lose two of your, uh, well, if it's an odd number, you only lose two, uh, two forces if it's only three here, and uh, so on. You just do a bit of math, easy math to, to figure that out. And broken divisions happen when, a, you know, a, a unit becomes broken rather when it is shattered in combat or it breaks from the break result test. So don't lose more than half of your units or that will send your uh, division into broken status. There's another way that you can determine if a division is broken and that's if all of the units in the division become shaken. All right, so if you have not lost a single unit but every single unit in your division has become shaken then it is considered broken. Now, there's one chance you have, if all your units become shaken, 
your commander or general gets one chance on the next turn that's yours to rally a unit. If he successfully is able to rally a unit, then he can continue fighting on and the unit's not bro broken. So you get one chance in that case where if all of your units in one division are shaken, the commander or general has one chance to try and rally them. And if he can't because they're all fighting, or if he fails the test, that's too bad, your unit's considered broken. And so will the whole division be because they're all shaken. Now, there is a little bit of an exception to the rule that uh, the rule book states here. It says that uh, depending on the composition of the division itself, light infantry and light cavalry can be ignored for that uh, more than half calculation. So, for example, here, I often play Romans. Um, and, well, normally my, my, my Velite units are mixed in with my Roman units. And when I use my Velites and I've lost them or they break or shatter, I don't count them towards my uh, broken division count of half units because they're just light troops. They're the cheapest, poorest, lightest troops in my army. So I just feel that the heavy troops would just ignore them and uh, wouldn't matter about it, right? However, if I had a unit that was completely light units, like let's say I had a unit of four or a division of four Velite units, I, I, I might consider that rule not to be the same because all the unit is considered of light infantry of equal strength okay and of course you can modify this rule if you think every unit should count towards being broken and calculated just do that then it's up to you but that's just how the rule book has put it they just put the poor quality troops if they're fielded along the, you know like slingers or, 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 or poor javelin men or something like that if, if they break and run the, the elite troops the trained troops just kind of shake it off and they say whatever we'll only run if uh our, 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 our equals or betters break. Now, if your unit breaks because of combat results or it shatters, it's just removed from the board. But if your unit has become broken, people can actually still act in a way as the unit's broken. So if this is my army here, and let's say the Romans here have broken, and let's assume that everyone's shaken here and he doesn't rally them, a lot of assumptions, but <laughs> let's say they're all broken. They can only do one thing as a broken division. They're still in the field. Their only option, their only order is to retire. Retire is them leaving the field. They're heading back towards the side of the board that they came on. So they start marching and running back towards the way they came. So all the rules for proximity and um, initiative still come into play. You give orders and the only order you can give is retire. You still roll the same. You still take distance penalties into consideration. Now. If you fail an order, you still get to move once for free if they're retiring, okay? So even, you know, even if you fail orders for the retiring, everyone's going to be moving once if they get the order. Now, you might think, like, what's the point of having the unit retire? If the unit's, if the, if the division's broken and all the units are broken, why not just remove them and, and, and that part of the game? Well, it's because they still can have an active role, you know? Sometimes they might be in combat when the division's bro broken. If they're in combat and you, have a, and you have a broken division, they can keep fighting in their retreat. So if they're shaken and all your other units are shaken or, or died and they have to retire, they're gonna end that combat. So they could potentially be killed in that combat while they're trying to retire, or they could wipe out the enemy. There's some rules there though. If they are broken in the division, they can only choose to give ground, or if they are, uh, if they win, if they win the combat, they can only choose to give ground or uh, hold their ground. They cannot advance towards an enemy. So if you win a combat with a broken division unit, they will not be pursuing an enemy if the enemy gives ground. They'll just hold their ground or they themselves will move away backwards, which makes more sense because they're broken, they're retiring, they're trying to get out of there, okay? Um, also, retire can this order can also be given to disordered units. So this is kind of a uh, an exception where the orders to retire, and if normally where you can't get orders when your unit is disordered, they can receive the retire order because you know they're disordered. They don't want to be there anymore. It makes sense to try to get out. If you have artillery pieces in a broken division, they're automatically destroyed. It's assumed that the uh, it's medium and heavy artillery. Scorpions could still operate, but it's assumed that the artillery pieces, their crewmen, they just leave and the artillery pieces remain on the board. I think that's kind of cool. Just take the crew off and leave the artillery pieces. Maybe it's a captured scenario for points if you create your own kind of point system. Um, 
Also, you can still shoot when you're retiring. So essentially, you could order, <laughs> you could order your unit to retire off the board. If they're armed with like slings or bows, they can shoot on their way out, which may potentially stop other units from hurting your other divisions or from the guys chasing you. You can also counter charge if you have cavalry, kind of like you know, uh, uh, that you're breaking and, and retiring. But if if you can counter charge, if you're leaving and your unit's not shaken, they can counter charge. It's kind of cool. Maybe they ward off the enemy. Maybe they destroy them, but they won't be able to sweep advance or, or pursue enemies. It's kind of just a counter charge to ward them off. If they win, they continue their move out. Of course, I've said you can't charge the enemy. You're basically doing any kind of thing to get yourself and your units off the battlefield. Their order and only thing on their mind is to retire. So beyond the victory and defeat section, you get into a section called troop types. And I've kind of been mentioning troop types throughout the game. But basically you get the heavy, medium, skirmish, and light infantry. They're all different infantry types and they have different rules. They have some stats and examples here. Now before um, you get into Hail Caesar, if, you, if you're watching this, you've not got into it before, if you're used to points in the game, the rule set up here was not meant for points. So a lot of Hail Caesar, if you don't use points, is deciding on your own troop types and what you think is suitable for your troop types. So this section of the book kind of tells you more about like, you know, cavalry and the types of cavalry, basic stats that you could apply. These are all adjustable since you're not using points. So you can adjust them and, and, and tweak them the way you want to, how you think is fair, which makes Hail Caesar a really open game for like scenarios. And, and if you don't like what was written in here, you can change it yourself. There's light chariots, heavy chariots, elephants, light artillery. Uh, medium heavy troops, and they even get into like different kind of specific troops, like medium infantry archers and medium infantry spears and bows. Like you know, they have a, a bunch of different examples here that you can build off of in the book. Pike phalanx and the heavy infantry. There's heavy infantry, two-headed axes, two-handed weapons, stuff like that. Even the Persian scythe chariot, and they get quite specific on some of them. So you can build off these if you want. And yeah. The next section here I want to talk about is a selection of useful rules and I'm not going to get into this too heavily. You get the rule book and you guys get through this yourselves. But um, it basically gives you special rules for different troops like uh, maybe your troops are brave or drilled. Uh, all, mostly all Roman troops are drilled so they're kind of uh, benefited by that. You know, They have different rules for different types of troops. Elites, elephants, there's lances for the medieval period. Maybe you have freshly uh, raised troop or levy troops, stuff like that. Maybe you got expert bowmen from Crete, marksmen or something. And all of these um, are just special rules that you can apply to different units in your army. There are some lists that already have some rules uh, marked in them, pre-made point lists, or even just if you look back in the previous section with the troop types, you can just see a bunch of different uh, units that maybe you want to apply these rules to. So I won't get into all of them. You know, read them yourselves and figure it out from there. Beyond this point, they start to get into scenarios. And I'm not going to get into this because everyone has a different scenario and era they prefer. But they have different eras. Like this is a chariot era here. And they give you specific scenarios if you want to play and set up. You can, like many rule books give you. They give you the sides and the troops, which of course you can all tweak. And you see there's no points or anything. They're just giving you sides based off the battle. So maybe they're fair, maybe they're not. I'm not sure if the uh they were designed to be fair or not i i usually make my own scenarios you get the classical age just a quick flip through you get the three copolites and they did their battles in the peloponnesian wars um you get the romans of course and it just gets right into lots of stuff um i think it gets right into what keeps going on you get the crusades in here so you, you get a, a good historic coverage from like Biblical all the way up to uh, angels. I like their boards and their cool examples. This kind of looks like an aquarium piece, <laughs> which is really useful to use. If you have aquarium pieces in for medieval times and you want to represent uh, broken down Roman things, they work wonderfully in 28 millimeters if you doctor them up. And they have a whole bunch, you know, all these scenarios also they include uh, the, the conditions for winning or what you have to do, defending or, or, you know, here for example, you're supposed to hold somewhere, Huns are coming in, I'm assuming to take out some, some Dark Age Romans, but yeah, look through that, not oh, the Dark Age, that wasn't quite the Dark Ages, but you know what I mean, I guess I jumped the gun when I said there was Crusades, but there, there, there are Crusades, trust me, see, I'm Crusaders, <laughs> so whatever history you want, Hail Caesar has something covered from Biblical 
all the way up to, I would even say War of the Roses era, right when it gets into Pike and Shot. You get to the Land Snack era and you, you can kind of, kind of play it in Hail Caesar, but it's probably better to get the Pike and Shot by that era, so. Just lots of art. <laughs> there is a, oops, so there is a section for smaller models. If you don't like 28 millimeters, they give you a bunch of stuff about doing smaller models. And Hail Caesar is excellent to play in 15 millimeter and 10 millimeter because you can make a grand epic battle. You know, I play on six by four foot uh, tables usually, and you only get so much space with 20 space with 28 millimeters. But if you're doing like 10 millimeters, you get big battles going. So I I'll probably do some of those one day. I'm into 28 millimeters now, so I probably won't. But they got some army list guides here, and they do have a section about points here. However, I think uh, these points are great. They only really cover the Romans and the British list. And I think this rule book was when it was made for, this is for the original uh, starter kit. Um, excuse the British army, interestingly, because this book would have came from the, uh, the what's it called, Rome Conquest of Gaul, which was an inaccurate depiction of the old starter kit because it had Imperial Romans facing off against Gallic Celts, but the Romans took over Gaul in Caesar's time. They weren't the Imperial Romans yet, so it's kind of inaccurate. They've since redone that box set, so it's now accurately depicting the Britannia forces versus the Imperial Romans, but prior to that, it was Conquest of Gaul, and it wasn't accurate <laughs> for the box de depiction. In any case, it is uh, they've also made the rule books smaller. This is the older books, they're bigger now. Um, you can get the small size version of the starter kits as well. Of course, there's a summary in the end, which you can read through. I, I sometimes go through this because, you know, you play different games and you forget stuff. Other than that, there is a quick reference sheet section in the back, which is always useful because you are not, probably not going to remember all of the break tests unless you play religiously. I usually do for infantry because they're pretty standard, but like skirmishers and cavalry sometimes I don't remember. And then they just give you uh, useful rules for different troops at the end. And that is it for looking at the Hail Caesar rule book. That's all I'm going to talk about <laughs> with the Hail Caesar walkthrough. Closing remarks. Um, this series was filmed over a long period of time. I don't want to say it took me a long time to film because it really didn't, you know, doing 20 or 30 minute stints at first and then going down to smaller stints when I could was okay. The problem was that you get busy in life and things happen that kind of delay your plans. And I've kind of made my own uh, resolution here in 2021 to do more YouTube content. So I was able to finish this fairly quickly right up to the new year here because I'm keeping to my my resolution as much as I can. Um, in a previous video, I mentioned something bad happened to my Romans. Um, friend of the family, a small child that belongs to this friend, while I was away, got a hold of my toys. And you can see here on these guys back here that they were not touched because they're on 40 millimeter bases. However, all of, well, not the Triarii, tr luckily the Triarii weren't hit either, but most of my line infantry, my Romans, and even my light troops, my abilities, and unfortunately some cavalry, which I cannot recover, were totally destroyed by this kid. <laughs> and I laugh now, but I was angry when I came home. I walk in there and my dog comes with me and I think my dog sensed my shock and my, and my, uh, I was without words. And yeah, it took me a while to repair everything, but I, I don't think you can even tell they're destroyed anymore. I worked hard to rebuild and repaint them, and that was a big delay towards when I, I started getting into them again, to filming that is, and then this event happened. And I was very unfortunate to have that happen, but you know, you gotta let things go, forgive things, and, and you know, I've not had good luck with these Romans in, in regards of uh, putting them together. They've broken many times. I think every single unit has sustained some sort of damage, be it through moving or the dog actually doing something or some silly kid. Um, everything except the generals. Uh, like I said, my Celtic cavalry that I used in some videos, they're completely gone. One guy survived and his kid survived. But the other guys, the War Game Factories guys, were so tall that I just, that's the only thing I had the heart not to fix. So I kind of let them go and let them be. 
but uh, yeah I got more sound nights on the go here they're coming up and I'm gonna show the case them to you soon I've been working a lot on the models faster than I normally do so I probably have another full medium troop unit here really quickly um, and they're fun to do I mix up the colors as you can see and I'm hoping throughout the winter to actually finish all the plastics in that unit and then hopefully if time allows it before winter ends I'm gonna start getting into my Aventine cavalry I have some southern Italian mercenaries that they put together different kind of troops and some uh, Pyrrhic war uh, troops that are going to represent an Italian ally division to fight for both Rome and Carthage. So I'm really excited about that. So so beyond that and the destruction that happened on these guys, I'm still kicking. I won't give up on the hobby because I love it. And I'm going to keep making videos of unboxings now that this Hail Caesar is done. And I'm also going to get into some other rule sets I'm interested in, um, which involve also ancients as well. And uh, I also have a World War II... Uh, uh, Bussigeri army for the Italians in Libya and Egypt and, and North Africa there and we'll get into some of that stuff too eventually I've done some nice terrain for that so so I thank you all guys for watching today and thank you for liking and watching the whole of the series if you have thank you for subscribing and if you want to have any comments leave them down below and if you have any questions or want to shout out those can come too so yeah thank you all for watching and have a good one